Mishra sir, are you there? Mr. Sir is joining. Uh, within one minute, we shall start.
Have you joined, Mr. Sir? Okay, sir has joined. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. thank you. Ah, it has started, sir. Yeah. Okay. Good afternoon, respected dignitaries, colleagues, and dear students. To the second day of the National Wave Workshop on Chemistry Orientation for UG and PG students. We have already successfully completed the first day of our three-day national wave workshop. Yesterday, we had got the opportunity to listen to two eminent speakers, respected Professor Ain Sattamurti sir and respected Professor Shumana Dr. Madam. We have learned many things from them. Thank you, respected dignitaries, for enriching all of us. Today, we have with us Professor Ashutosh Ghosh, sir, the Honorable Vice Chancellor of Rani Rashmani Green University, Professor Vijesh Parisar, the President of ACT, Professor Shantulu Chakraborty, sir, Principal, Chingur Government College, Professor Gulshan Sheikh, madam, Professor Unupa Kumpar, madam, Professor Shmona Dr. madam, Professor Nidaja Dachapuspe, madam, Professor Prim Mohan Mistra, sir, Vice President, ACT East Zone, Dr. Chuitali Chodhuri, madam, IQSC Coordinator, Chingur Government College, Professor S.P. Singh, sir, and many others. May I now invite Respected Professor Prem Mohan Mistra, sir, Vice President ACT East Zone, to deliver the welcome address. Sir, please. Okay. Thank you, Amritji. Thank you, sir. First of all, I would like to thank the Principal Professor Santanu Chakrabarti, Principal of Government General Degree College, Singapore, and Department of Chemistry, for hosting this mega event. And I am also thankful to our President Rajesh Pare sir and General Secretary Devi Prahusha for giving permission to collaborate the program. And also, I am thankful to Amritji for giving me this opportunity to talk with you. And uh, sir, as we all know, we are in the second day of three days chemistry orientation program for UG and PG students. We all know how important is orientation for the students, particularly in the field of chemistry. And that also in the, this COVID pandemic situation, we must observe and we must organize such workshops in online and if permission is granted then offline mode also to orient our students. My job is here to welcome the guest. So first of all, I would like to welcome Professor Ashdos Hoshar, Vice Chancellor, for taking pains to deliver lecture and be part with this orientation program. I welcome Dr. Nirja Jay Prakash Das Putre, Senior Technical Officer, IISER Pune, for accept, accepting our invitation to deliver a wonderful lecture and interact with our students. I also welcome Dr. Anupa, Anupa Kambar, Associate Professor, Savitri Bai Phule, Pune University, for sparing some time from precious schedule and to deliver a lecture on the, this three days program. All the resource persons across the country 
and all participating UG and PG students of different colleges and universities. I also welcome to all the persons who are directly or indirectly involved in making this mega event a grand success. So I will not take much time in this welcome address and now I hand over the program to Amritji for starting the technical session. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Sir has set the tone of today's session with his lively address. May I now invite Dr. Choitali Chaudhuri, Madam, IQSC Coordinator of Chingur Government College, to say a few words. Madam, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Amrit. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, ma'am. Our honorable guests, panelists, faculty members, and students across the country. The Department of Chemistry, Government General Degree College, Singur, West Bengal, and Association of Chemistry Teachers of Homi Bhabha Center for Science Education, TIFR, Mumbai, in association with Rani Rashpuni Green University, West Bengal, are uh, organizing a three day national level web workshop on chemistry orientation for UG and PG students. Today is the second day of the workshop. We are blessed to have eminent resource personnel from across the country as panelists for this workshop. We hope this workshop will ignite the spirit of chemistry education among the students. I came to know that more than 1,500 participants from the various institutions across the country are attending the workshop. I feel privileged to announce that we have amongst us today, Professor Prem Mohan Mishra, Vice President, Association of Chemistry Teachers, is zone and associated with Komi Bhabha Center for Science Education, TIFM Mumbai. Dr. Nijja Jayaprakash Dasaputre, Senior Technical Officer, Aiza Pune. Dr. Anupa Kumbhar, Associate Professor, Savitri Bai Phule, Pune University. A very hearty welcome to you all, sir and ma'am. Thank you so much for gracing this occasion in spite of your busy schedule. We are honored. I also want to thank and I also want to congratulate the Department of Chemistry for this endeavor, especially during this pandemic situation. I wish all the success and all the best wishes for this workshop. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, madam. Now let us move to the technical session. The first speaker of today's session is Dr. Niraja Jayaprakash Dashaputra, madam from Aizar Pune. Probably we all know that yesterday afternoon a massive fire broke out in the campus of Aizar Pune and it caused serious damage. Before I introduce Madam, I must thank her for finding the time for this workshop even after having to face such an accident. It will be an injustice if I do not mention the time and efforts have been put in by Niraja Madam Professor Unupa, Madam, and Professor Gulchan, Madam, for, for this particular workshop. They have had several conversations amongst themselves before finalizing their topic of presentation. They have also discussed the assignment problems with each other. Their commitment, dedication, and sincerity towards chemistry education are exemplary. My heartfelt gratitude to all of you, respected teachers. Professor Nidaja Tashaputra, Madam, completed her undergraduate studies in chemical technology from, in, uh, from Institute of Chemical Technology, ICT Mumbai, after which she obtained a doctoral degree in organic chemistry at University of Maryland, USA. During her PhD, she recognized a love for teaching and completed university teaching and learning program at Maryland University. She worked as a faculty at Claremont University, USA, post her doctoral studies. She joined Kaiser Pune in July 2016 and is currently a senior technical officer. Her research interests are in pedagogy development for teaching chemistry. She has over six years of teaching experience in India and USA. She loves participating in various science workshops, 
as a workshop trainer as well as a delegate and interacting in students and teachers alike. Apart from this, she loves doing on wheel pottery and painting in her free time. May I now may I now request Madam to make her presentation? Thank you, Amritji, for uh, for the introduction and uh, first. To begin with, let me thank all the organizers for giving me a chance uh, to speak to such a wonderful audience across the country. I know that many students across the country, UG and PG students are listening to me and thank you. Thank you, uh, ACT, for giving me this opportunity to talk. Um, yes, can I share yes, my screen? Definitely. Okay. Sure. Actually, our students uh, know you very well through Choyam NPTEL portal. They actually follow your lectures okay. on studio <laughs> chemistry and others. So, you are quite okay. familiar to these students. That's good. That's good. <laughs> okay, can everyone see my screen? Yes, 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 it is. That is visible. Visible. Yes. So let me uh, also start the slideshow. Okay. Okay. So uh, today I'm going to talk about the power of good questions. And uh, when I uh, came to know that I have to talk to students, uh, I, I uh, instead of you know, taking a particular topic, I thought of uh, giving this talk uh, a flavor of history of science uh, as to how we really came to know what we know today. So going back uh, to, you know, uh, early 1800s, 1900s, how do we really know uh, the chemistry that we know today? So th really, there is a lot of power in good questions. And to begin with, here is my favorite cartoon, which says question everything. And then the other person says, why? You know, so uh, jokes apart, questions really are the basis of everything that we know today. So if questioning stops, so does the learning. So, uh, you know, questioning is one of the main thinking and processing skills, uh, which is embodied in our critical thinking or creative thinking, problem solving nature. So uh, all the questions that you're trying to answer as graduate students or undergraduate students, or when you're learning something, you first become curious about something and then you try to find the answer. And in fact, I have uh, Albert Einstein's quote here, which says, uh, I have no special talents. I'm only passionately curious. So really coming up with good question is a talent to have. And I'm going to discuss some key questions in chemistry, uh, and these are not the only questions, of, of course, but I, I just thought these questions are amazing to discuss with students, so I've included them. Okay, so let's begin. Um, to observe the experiment carefully, and uh, it's a school level experiment. Uh, why I've chosen this experiment is because I want to talk about the kind of questions that I think are good Okay, so uh, let me quickly go through this experiment. So here is a Petri dish and we are going to add some water to it. Okay, so there is a layer of water in the Petri dish and uh, on one end, we are going to add some lead nitrate and on the other end, we are going to add some Ki, potassium iodide. Okay, so lead nitrate on one end and Ki on the other end and I let the solution sit just like that without disturbing it. And slowly, you know, the, what I see is there is a reaction front forming in the middle, okay? So I see a nice yellow line uh, that is forming in the middle. So I, if I just go a little quicker, I don't want to spend the entire, uh, you know, video showing this. So as you can see, it's a very nice reaction front that forms because, you know, both both the soils have dissociated into the water and now they've mixed together or reacted together to really form that reaction front. And if I shake it, it's going to go completely yellow, right? Now, it's a reaction that all of us have studied. Um, it's a double displacement reaction. We know, uh, you know, there is Ki and PbNO3. They react together to form PbI2, which is solid. And uh, it's yellow in color. So that's why we see that reaction front. Now, the kind of questions that one may ask looking at this experiment is, what is the reaction happening? Do we know the stoichiometry of the reaction? Uh, how do we know that it is PBI2? 
you know and so on and so forth but if i twist the reaction a little bit and i ask what factors affect the position of this reaction front so the yellow reaction front that formed in the middle how do we know where it will form and uh, then if i ask uh, a next question that can we design an experiment to test the effect of amount of lead nitrate on the position of this reaction front can we do can we really you know get into the shoes of a researcher so even at the school level we can start thinking like a research chemist is the point that i want to uh, you know uh, put forward because now in order to design this experiment you will have to think about the methodology to record the readings you will have to think about the controls you will have to think about the dependent independent variable how will i know how does the reaction front get affected and these are the kind of questions that i'm talking about the questions that make you uh, you know put on your thinking cap such that you get into the uh, you know the position of a researcher so let's say you did this reaction multiple times and every time the reaction front formed closer to the lead nitrate so then you start asking why so why doesn't it form closer to ki is it always uh, going to be closer to lead nitrate and then you start asking deeper questions questions at the sub microscopic level like do i what do i need to know about the the two ions you know pb2 plus ion and i minus ion what about the other ions present in the solution and uh, so on and so forth so and then you may want to talk about what really affects is it the ionic radius is it the mass is it the polarizability electronegativity what factor is really affecting the reaction front to form closer to lead nitrate so uh, the questions uh, that i feel are good are the questions wherein you go to the end of the uh, question such that you don't stop with an answer you always ask why you know so if it forms closer why uh, if somebody says uh, it's the mass that affects then you pose a questions how do i know that um, can I, can i conduct an experiment to figure out whether it is really the mass that is affecting the position of the reaction front and so on and so forth so you go on uh, probing that question further and further until you really can't ask any more questions about it okay so uh, here is a question uh, for you so there is a nice picture here uh, of a beautiful ocean and what questions comes to your mind when you see this picture if i ask you that and give you maybe 10 seconds uh, can you think of a question okay so uh, i i know it's not going to be very interactive uh, due to the you know the problems with the medium but uh, i i think the first question that anyone would come up is right now is that when can i go on a vacation you know so <laughs> looking at this the first question that comes to my mind is that but uh, jokes apart uh, a similar question was asked by john tindall and the question was why is the sky blue and he came up uh with the explanation that uh it's due to scattering so he came up with this tindal apparatus uh, through which he uh, basically shined lights of various colors uh and uh, he also in this tube he uh, he could put in various fumes so starting from water vapor various kinds of fumes or various gases he could fill it in and then when he observed that uh, one end of the tube remained blue for white light and the other end had turned slightly reddish so uh, then he asked then okay uh, probably then he said it is because of the particles in the air there is something happening the sun's light is getting scattered but again we can't stop here so we go further ahead and we say why is it like that why is the uh, why are the particles in the air or the molecules in the air atmosphere really scattering the light in that manner and then we uh, look at the spectrum of the blue sky we see that there is a lot of blue uh, but there are also other components of green yellow red so what is it that is making the sky appear blue you may uh, start thinking that okay uh, blue has a shorter wavelength so the uh, you know the the uh, the light with the shorter wavelength is going to get scattered more than the light with the longer wavelength uh, and that's something that tindal came up with but that's not where we stopped the next person to really probe into this was really and really started thinking 
okay but why sh- why should it happen like that that only the uh, the blue wavelength i agree that it is uh, you know it has a really smaller wavelength as compared to red then is that why it is getting scattered more and he actually came up with an equation uh, that talks about the intensity of scattered light and he saw that that it was proportional to the 1 over lambda raised to 4 meaning that uh, if it is really really shorter wavelength that light is going to get scattered much more 10 times more uh, than something with a, la- a longer wavelength and that's the reason uh, you know the sky appears blue but that's not it right we can't really just stop here because then we ask what is it that that is there in the air molecules that is causing this and then we start talking about the composition of the atmosphere and we start talking about the size of nitrogen and oxygen gases uh, because these are the molecules that are mainly predominant in the uh, atmosphere and uh, you know really talk about how is the resonance of oxygen and nitrogen really uh, interacting with the incoming photons and it is making it uh, you know g- doing this elastic scattering and uh, we know that the the scattering uh, theory didn't just stop here there was also cv raman later on who came up with the inelastic scattering and so on and so forth so people have not stopped asking question and and when you want to come up with a theory that explains something you always see the series of whys to give give you a uh, uh, questions to think about uh, here is a a picture that has blue air and blue water so why is the ocean blue so that's also something to think about and it has a very different answer than uh, why the sky is blue so i would like you to you all to think about that and also um, will the sky always appear blue so what about other planets so here is a picture of sunset on mars now on earth we see the sunset reddish right reddish orange color because what happens is you are very very far so at the point of sunset the observer is very far away from the sun so by the time uh, the sun rays uh, come uh, you know or the light uh, reaches the observer what has happened is that most of the blue light is scattered and what remains is the red and orange light uh, but on mars you are seeing completely different you are seeing a bluish sunset so what is happening there uh, let me also tell you that the atmosphere of mars has carbon dioxide and very thin layer of carbon dioxide present so is that why how does it really you know uh, get affected so that's something i would like to think about uh, so next i have this blue uh, dye here and the reason why this blue indigo appears blue is very different from why this i appear blue right so here in i have a nice chromophore uh, the h chromophore of indigo and then looking at this why indigo is blue you start ans- asking so many questions you could ask questions about absorption uh, about conjugation how does con- conjugation affect color uh, why are some molecules colored and all others are not or what is the structure function relationship meaning if i make some changes in the structure of this particular dye how will its properties change will it change uh, the color will it change uh, other properties like solubility fastness how does it really affect the overall function of this molecule and um, just for uh, the curious uh, listeners here what we have is uh, when you add two bromines here uh, the molecule doesn't remain blue anymore it becomes nice purple colored dye so that is the kind of questions chemists have always asked we have been very curious about uh, the nature of matter around us and we have always tried to ask uh, you know how can we play around with this matter such that it becomes more useful to us you know so for example if uh, the indigo is not very soluble in this form can i uh, add some carboxylic acid groups to make it more soluble or uh, you know so on and so forth so you have always tried to play around with the properties to make it more useful for the mankind okay so with that i'm going to begin to my first story of today uh, this was just an introduction so uh, my first story for today is the first good question it's the familiar enemy okay and uh, i want to take you 
to 1850 when uh, Gustave was murdered in Belgium. Okay, so he was a person. He was uh, uh, murdered by his brother-in-law. Okay, and this became a very famous case of murder. Not because they couldn't find who did it, but because there was a clear evidence of poisoning. They could even see the person, the brother-in-law, had done it, but you couldn't prove it very easily that. Uh, the brother-in-law had poisoned Gustav. How is that? So the brother-in-law, what he did was he took some tobacco leaves, okay, and he extracted pure nicotine out of it. Okay, so nicotine uh, is a structure. You can see the structure here of nicotine. It has uh, two rings. One is a six-membered ring. One is a five-membered ring. Uh, both of them have heteroatoms. And if you really look at the molecule, it is a nice twisted form uh, here. Okay, so. Uh, this person extracts pure nicotine, poisons his brother-in-law, and uh, to remove any evidence of poisoning, he later on washes his throat with acetic acid or vinegar, and then also burns some clothes and other things. So basically, making sure that uh, you know you can't really prove the evidence of nicotine on the body. Okay. But in the uh, in in the house of this particular murderer, they could find, you know, uh, bottles of extracted nicotine. They could find uh, various animals that he had tried this poison on before giving it to his, uh, you know, his victim. So it became a very famous case because everybody knew who was the murderer, but we couldn't find the answer. And in fact, in the court, uh, this was shouted that. Let us tell would-be poisoners that use plant poisons. Fear nothing, your crime will go unpunished. There is no corpus delicti, that is the physical evidence for it. So why is that? See, before this, the poisoners or most of the cases that involved poisoning used to use uh, metals like or uh, some other uh, chemicals that could be traced back so arsenic was a very known poison and uh, to there were there were methods established to figure out if somebody was poisoned with arsenic for that you had to burn the tissue you had to figure out the presence of arsenic but now nicotine being sensitive to heat you couldn't burn the tissue and figure out how could you really you know detect the presence of nicotine and remember we are talking about 1850s so we didn't have any other fancy methods of figuring out uh, that we have today and uh, that's why it became a very uh, you know a, a talk case because people struggled with the idea that how do I prove the presence of a particular molecule and uh, nicotine is, is, is a familiar enemy because even though we see it around every time we don't realize how harmful it is so just to tell you that it travels from lung to the brain. So when you inhale, uh, it, it only takes about seven seconds. And one cigarette will have about one milligram of nicotine. Uh, the lethal dose is around 30 to 60 milligrams. And uh, just to, for the comparison, arsenic, which is a very known poison again, uh, has a lethal dose of more than that. So around 80 to 150 milligrams. So that's a, uh, so nicotine is much, much toxic and has a rapid onset of action and it affects not only your uh, not only the caustic actions but it also affects your peripheral and central nervous system so uh, although we know this molecule exists around us it is much more lethal when it is in the pure form okay and that's what was shown by this murder case now this case was given to autostas to uh, to really figure out uh, how can we really prove the presence of nicotine uh, that, that was there involved in the murder? So he knew some characteristics. He knew that nicotine degrades with heat. Uh, he knew that it's an alkaloid. So it has, it is basic in nature. So it forms salts with weak acids. Uh, it can get degraded uh, with oxygen and light when you expose it for a long time. And uh, the weak acids also liberate alkaloid uh, from their salt. So if you have a nicotine salt and, uh, sorry, did I say weak acid? So we, uh, if you have uh, a nicotine salt and if you put it in uh, a weak base like ammonia, it's going to liberate uh, the 
the nicotine away uh, from the solution and uh, that is what he used to prove the presence of nicotine in the tissue of gustav okay now you might find this question very easy because this is something that even a bsc student today uh, has done not only they have studied this they have probably done or tried doing an extraction of an alkaloid right and uh, but that time remember without knowing the structure of the molecule it was very difficult so he came up with the stas auto method uh, wherein you take the compound so you have uh, or the the tissue and you basically cut it uh, make it uniform add tartaric acid so that whatever nicotine is present on the tissue forms the salt and put it in ethanol water mixture now that you have formed the salt of nicotine you when you filter it it's going to come in the aqueous phase right and then when you put it in base it is going to again liberate uh, uh, the nicotine in the pure form and when you do the organic solvent extraction of it you are going to get uh, the the alkaloid in the organic phase so very simple uh, steps so this is something as i said even now many students should be able to answer this but remember at that time it took him many months to figure this out because he didn't know the structure he didn't know the properties very well so it took him some time to study this and figure out uh this was the first forensic method that was developed forensic chemistry method that was developed to you know uh, prove the presence of something or presence of a molecule or a chemical uh, on uh, at the crime scene and uh, in fact it is even used today so uh, that's why i thought of including this story but that was 1850 and we asked questions like this at that time and as i said that we have progressed a lot from that uh point of view now we ask very different questions so what are the different questions that we ask today uh so as we know that nicotine affects uh you know uh, the global health uh, you know in a in a very uh, devastating manner there are more than 4 million deaths per year uh, that affect that get that that are there because of consumption of nicotine so it could be due to lung cancer it could be due to some other uh you know diseases that are related to lung health and uh, or or it also affects the 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 overall well being of the consumer because uh, it is very addictive so it's very difficult to get rid of the addiction of nicotine so now the kind of questions that we are asking or chemists are asking or have asked in the last few decades are uh, are related to how does nicotine really affect our health how does it bind to various uh, to various receptors in our body uh, how can we get rid of the the addictive properties of nicotine such that we can help uh, you know the the people who are suffering from addiction can we use nicotine as a therapeutic agent if yes for what diseases can we use it so uh, for example there are trials uh, wherein the nicotine patch is being used uh, for the treatment of alzheimer's disease and so uh, there are various other questions that we are asking now which go much deeper into the uh, biological chemistry of this particular molecule and uh, that's where i want to talk about how nicotine really binds to receptors so there are uh, i think in yesterday's talk we did talk about a little bit about ion gates and uh, how various receptors act as uh, you know the gates uh, that can be opened and shut such that the flow of ions can be moderated so in a similar way uh, neurotransmitters so nicotine is a neurotransmitter uh when it binds to specific receptors on the plasma membrane uh of the postsynaptic cell what happens is as it binds so as you can see as this blue uh dot here binds to this particular receptor it's going to open up the gate and it's going to let the ions flow back and forth okay and that is what is really causing the signaling of your nerve cells so uh where does nicotine really bind nicotine binds to acetylcholine receptors in our body okay and acetylcholine receptor is really really big okay uh, as you can see this is the big structure of the acetylcholine receptor you can see some part of it is above the membrane some part of it is below the membrane uh, that's what it is such that when a molecule like nicotine binds uh, on 
the binding site, what happens is the gate kind of opens such that ions can flow through. Okay. Now, acetylcholine is a very important neurotransmitter for our body. Everything that we do when we flex a muscle, uh, acetyl, my brain is sending signal to my hand right now that I need to flex this muscle. And it is through the acetylcholine that is, you know, uh, binding to the corresponding nerves and sending that signal. So uh, it's it's a it's a it's a neurotransmitter that is very very useful. Okay. Uh, now nicotine binds to the same receptors, so the bind it binds to the acetylcholine receptors. The question is, if nicotine binds to the same receptors and if acetylcholine is involved in uh, you know our movement. Why don't people, when they smoke cigarettes, why don't they start twitching? You know, why don't they start having all of these involuntary muscle movements? You know, they are very much in control of their body. So how can we really say that nicotine, which has a very high binding affinity towards this particular receptor, by the way. So in fact, people often call the acetylcholine receptors as nicotinic receptor because nicotine, in fact, binds better to this receptor than acetylcholine. Okay. So how is it that the people who are smoking cigarettes are not really twitching and twisting their, you know, the whole body and how are they able to control their movements? And in order to answer that question, we need to first think about how nicotine really binds to this receptor. And that's the question I want to talk about for the next few slides. For that, we need to first figure out what is the structure of this acetylcholine research. So uh, bear with me. I'm just going to walk through some of the research that has happened in the past few decades. So, uh, okay. So what does the research so far tells us? That the acetylcholine receptor is such that it's a pentameric symmetric array. So there are five subunits. And uh, what we know is that the binding site uh, you know, this was find, found with the help of acetylcholine binding protein. Uh, that particular binding site has aromatic box. Okay, so there are tyrosine and, uh, you know, uh, these uh, residues here. So all of these are aromatic rings here, tryptophan and tyrosine residues that basically form a box kind of a thing. Okay, and in this box, the nicotine is going to sit. Okay, now that is interesting because if you look at the structure of nicotine, okay, let me go back and show the structure of nicotine here. People would have thought that nicotine actually binds, you know, using uh, the hydrogen bonding with the nitrogens. Okay, so the, 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 the uh, pyridine nitrogen here uh, should do hydrogen bonding and that's how nicotine binds, but that's not the case. In fact, Nicotine binds with the help of cation. Oh, I would like to buy because that's not an interaction that we typically talk about in our uh, organic chemistry syllabus. So what is this interaction? So if you have any cation, remember it's positively charged and a pi cloud, okay, if it's at a van der Waals distance with the uh, cation, there is going to be enough interaction between these two there is going to be an attractive force okay because there's the negatively charged electrons are uh, you know you have the quadruple movement of uh, moment of benzene and the cation is going to get attracted towards that quadruple movement right and you're going to have uh, a nice cation pi interaction and it's going to increase as the negative potential over the center of the ring increases right um, and that's the idea so if you see the benzene here uh, there's a lot of negative potential, the red zone in the middle. And as that red zone increases, the it's going to bind tighter and tighter to uh, the cation. And in fact, uh, you might think this as a, a really, really, you know, different. But cation, let's take a cation like K plus uh, potassium ion. It binds stronger to benzene in gas phase than water. So that's really interesting. So there's a lot of force, okay? And in fact, I have some values here. Uh, and you can also see that uh, as you change the substituents on this benzene ring, the cation pi interaction is going to get affected. So you have, if you have a cyano group or a, a you know nitrile group, which 
pulls the electron density of a uh, benzene ring you have a very weak cation pi interaction whereas for aniline which makes the benzene ring ring very electron rich you're going to have a very strong uh, cation pi interaction the same thing here if you go on adding fluorines to the benzene ring uh, so with one fluorine you have a value of 20 Uh, with two fluorines, it goes down to sixteen. With three fluorines, it goes down to twelve, and so on and so forth. So the inductive effect here plays a much more important role than resonance. And if you have induct inductively electron donating groups, it's going to give a very nice cation pi interaction. We have that cation on top of the benzene ring. Whereas if you have electron withdrawing groups, it's going to you know remove the electron density make this redder zone really green and thus it's going to reduce the cation pi interaction in fact uh, here are some tryptophan values so if you have uh, uh, you know uh, just the molecule the cation pi interaction is 32.6 but as you go on adding fluorines to this particular molecule you can see that the values go on decreasing and uh, that's very much correlated with the electron density of the pi cloud okay okay so this is okay to understand i uh, i i would think that this is how it should happen right because we know that cation is positively charged and the pi cloud is negatively charged the more the pi cloud the stronger is the interaction so that's that's okay to uh, you know agree with okay but in biology we have a lot of cation pi interaction and that's what i was talking about when we were talking about the the box of this Uh, you know nicotinic receptor or uh, acetylcholine receptor because in biology you have either phenylalanine or tyrosine or tryptophan and all of these are really uh, you know uh, the the amino acids that have a uh, a pi cloud that that can interact uh, with the cations that are present in our body and uh, whereas the cations sometimes are lysine or arginine or histidine histidine not so much because histidine we don't know whether it is uh, protonated or not depending on the uh, site but very often you see this kind of interaction uh, that is that is responsible for stability or for responsible for binding in biology and uh, where do we have that cation in nicotine so if you look at this nitrogen uh, it's going to be positively charged because when it's protonated this nitrogen becomes positively charged and that's what we are going to observe and this is the molecule that's going to go and bind in that box okay so that's perfectly good but then why we still haven't answered the question why uh you know it binds to two different receptors very differently so to the muscle receptors nicotine doesn't bind that strong but to our uh, central nervous system uh, the the receptors in our brain it binds in a much more stronger manner right so why is that because if it was binding to our muscles equally remember a single cigarette could have killed many people because you would have had a heart attack immediately after smoking it because if your muscles start uh, you know doing all kinds of involuntary movement your heart is also a muscle so very often people have wondered why hasn't nicotine killed more people why is it not binding to uh, your muscles that strong okay okay so in order to answer that puzzle chemists actually took the molecular biology approach and uh, we are trying to study the molecules from the synapse which is uh, synapse with, which is the nicotinic receptor here they basically got out of the synapse so we can't really do chemistry at that particular uh, at such a uh, you know minute level or sub microscopic level so what you do is we basically try to create different models of these receptors with different unnatural amino acids okay and every time you created a receptor with a different unnatural amino acid you try to measure the binding efficacy of nicotine with it so um, just to give an analogy okay so you have a lock and a key you don't know what is the structure of the the inside of the lock you're trying to figure that out and you're trying to figure out how this key particularly fits in this lock but now you can't really go in the lock and really inspect it it's very difficult uh, because you know we are talking about really really small receptors so 
what you do is every time you change the structure of the lock with the help of molecular biology and with the help of some other vehicles you're going to change the structure of the lock a little bit you're going to insert the key and you're going to see how well the lock is opening or closing okay and every single time you do that you're going to get more information about the nature of the lock from inside okay and that's what people did uh they made use of unnatural amino acids okay and the vehicle here was uh, xenopus oocytes so these are fish uh, embryos and uh, what you do is you basically incorporate these amino acids into them such that uh, now this becomes your new lock with a new structure from inside okay and you are going to do electrophysiology measurements because as i remember as i said that every time a molecule binds it's going to open up the gate for ions to flow in the same way we are going to have a, a new lock we are going to bind nicotine to it and we are going to see how well the uh, the gate is open now such that the ions can flow and every time you are going to measure uh, let's say ec50 value which refers to uh, the concentration which induces half way response between the baseline and maximum okay so that's what people did they tried multiple molecules different uh, you know many many locks were created to figure out what is the structure from inside and so let's look at what happens when we try to put in uh, nicotine with the muscle type nicot uh, the acetylcholine receptor so what happens when nicotine binds to our muscle receptors okay so let's say that you have a uh, you know the derivative tryptophan derivative here uh with one fluorine with two fluorines with three fluorines and with four fluorines uh the cation pi interaction is something that we have obtained from the gas phase study and the ec50 value is something that was observed with the help of molecular biology method that i talked about the electrophysiology method now when you plot your ec50 mutant over ec50 wild type so the graph of that versus the cation pi for muscle type uh receptor remember see that it doesn't match you know it gives you two different graphs there is no correlation between these two graphs but when you try to do that for the for our uh the the receptors in our brain which is alpha 4 beta 2 central nervous system acetylcholine receptor you get two plots which are very similar showing uh in fact which are uh, both straight lines showing that the nicotine when it binds to the the receptors in the brain it follows this fluorination trend and the cation pi interaction so when it is binding to our brain receptors it is doing the cation pi interaction but when it is binding to our muscle re receptors it is not you know doing the uh, very strong uh, cation pi interaction for the uh, muscle type and probably that's the reason why nicotine binds weakly to our muscles and people are able to smoke cigarettes as i said uh, but how do we know why is the difference because the structure of the the box is very same for both of them so why is it that in one case it does cation pi interaction and in the other case it doesn't do it well the reason is actually out of the box okay <laughs> so the aromatic box is right here and there is one residue which is very far away uh, at position 153 from this uh, what happens is if the kind of uh, mutation that is here it is going to really affect how tighter this binding is or how tighter this box is formed okay so if this residue is lysine which is in the case of our brain receptors it helps shaping of this aromatic box by forming hydrogen bonds so this is way away from the binding site by the way there is a small mutation way away from the binding site which makes the binding very very tight and so nicotine can bind tightly in the cation pi interaction whereas for the muscle type this is uh, glycine and it will not do hydrogen bonding so there is a lot of chemistry that goes on in our body and uh, the questions that we are asking today are either materials chemistry or uh, you know biochemistry side which really explain all of this uh, you know the processes that happen inside us so if we look at bigger picture 
what has this research helped us do it is uh, it has uh, you know the mankind has learned about better understanding of biological processes you can figure out better ad- medicines to tackle the nicotine addiction as i said there are 4 uh, million deaths that happen every year so can we really tackle the addiction such that or make different mo- molecules that can uh, help uh, the addicts or we can even the methods that are studied here can be applied to study function of other neurotransmitters and you know better medicines for other neurodegenerative diseases so uh, that's that's the bigger picture from the first story so or the first good question is that whatever question you have as a chemist it doesn't stop at that particular question it always ends up affecting a, a bigger picture uh, or you know or helps us uh, look at the bigger picture Okay so I'm going to come to my second good question and it's the story of the pill okay and uh, as you can see from uh, the pictures it is the story of the birth control pill now you may think what is there as the story but there is a lot of you know ups and downs uh, scientists have had to go through to really come up with this molecule or to really come up with the pill that women can take such that they can really uh, have a control over when they can give birth okay so let's start with that uh, i'm going to first talk about the steroid skeleton so steroids have this very specific skeleton so all the steroids pretty much in the uh, that are involved the animal and the plant steroids we'll see that there are three, uh, three you know a six membered ring and a fourth five membered ring and they are always termed as a b c d where the d ring is the five membered ring and uh, that's really the steroid skeleton now you may have attachments uh, you know at various places very often you have uh, methyls here uh, on the d ring you have various groups attached that will you know decide the function of this particular molecule just to give an example cholesterol here here is the most common animal steroid we all talk about cholesterol very often when we are talking about our health um, as you can see the structure is very similar these are the methyl groups here uh, you have an oh here and then you have this uh, alkyl group here okay so when we are talking about steroids uh, people knew that Uh, or people were really trying to figure out what are the hormones or uh, hormones that are involved uh, in our reproductive health or reproductive health how what are the hormones in males what are the hormones in females and, and uh, how, how how are their structures so initially uh, the first hormone really to get uh, you know extracted was this particular molecule androsterone here now this was obtained by, from around 17000 liters of urine yeah. okay so that uh, hello uh, can you hear me yes 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 hello yeah pass yeah yeah okay so um, why i want to point that out that from around 17000 liters of urine we could only extract 15 mg it's, it's a really small amount if you think about the size of the urine that was collected in order to figure out what is the hormone present there and uh, androsterone is actually metabolized and excreted from testosterone now this is a molecule that we always talk about okay and uh, as you can see uh, if we go ahead uh this is the oxidized form so basically this oh is oxidized uh, when it gets metabolized and it gets excreted now for females the first hormone that was actually uh, figured out was estrone and this was uh, you know this was kind of again extracted from the uh, the urine of pregnant females uh, pregnant uh you know women and uh, uh, again then after that after some years estradiol the the main female hormone was uh, you know extracted and figured out what is the structure of this particular molecule so uh, estradiol again was uh, extracted from 4 tons of uh, four tons of pigs ovaries and again you could get only little amount like 4 to 5 mg of estradiol was found so the point that we are trying to make here is that these hormones although they really control our health 
they are present in a very very small amount in our body they are not present in a huge amount such that they can be very well extracted okay and um, well, the other thing i want to really point out is if you want to see uh, if you compare estradiol versus testosterone you see how similar the structures are okay so there is only the change of this c double bond o which is an oh here so uh, that's the change of you the bonds here and the methyl group that is all that is the difference between the male hormone and the female hormone and that dip, dip, you know defines how uh, our body progresses as we age you know and uh, that's that's uh, something about the steroid nucleus is that if you look at this skeleton this is the best skeleton to really you know make you feel amazed about how really small changes in the molecule can really affect its function so if we look at all of the steroids they will have very similar structures but you will see that they affect very very differently when consumed so for example here is progesterone and it's a main pregnancy hormone so when uh, a female gets pregnant uh, this is the main hormone that controls the pregnancy it suppresses further uh, ovulation for that particular female and i want to again point out the difference between progesterone and testosterone so testosterone remember was the main main, main hormone the only difference is och3 okay so the, there is only one change in the molecule and the molecule does a completely different function one is a male hormone one is a pregnancy hormone in female so that's the beauty of this particular steroid nucleus and uh, that's uh, something i wanted to point out so when people were actually thinking about large scale synthesis of these steroids and remember they were not thinking of it from the point of view of getting remember we are talking about early 1900s and it was illegal for women to control their health control their reproductive health okay so it was illegal to have any control measures in in the us uh, at least okay now uh, why were then why were people really interested in this so this was mainly thought of the steroid synthesis was mainly thought of very often for breeding horses so uh, you know some fancy breeds of horses uh, all of these uh, uh, owners they didn't want uh the the horse uh, uh, the you know the female uh, to miscarry while carrying the the foal so that's why they wanted to inject these hormones into that that animal and that's why they were thinking about really coming up with the synthesis of these molecules so remember if we are talking about an era wherein the birth control uh, pill for humans was not even thought about this was nowhere in picture but people were trying to come up with the molecule that can help us uh, you know stop any kind of miscarriage uh, that that can happen it was also given to some females which had the history of miscarriage but not so much but again it was as i said these are very very small minute uh you know uh, quantity in our body so that's why it was only available to really really rich horse breeders okay so it was not for a common man or a common woman to really because it was very very expensive now uh if we needed to do a large scale synthesis of this what do we really need so first of all we need something artificial uh that can retain his activity so why is that so progesterone which really suppresses further ovulation which is a great uh, you know way of birth control uh it if you take it orally it doesn't uh, you know retain its activity it becomes very inactive once you uh, consume it because the stomach acids and other uh, you know processes really make it inactive uh on the other hand uh, if you inject progesterone it works well but then taking a daily injection or uh, you know for for anyone becomes very difficult uh, there are uh, so in order to really look at a large scale synthesis for this particular molecule people were thinking about can we have a ready four membered ring uh, preferably with the methyls in place such that with small modifications we can reach to progesterone we can synthesize this molecule on top 
and uh, that's when we look at the adventures of marker russell okay so this guy uh, was a rebel to begin with okay he was uh, uh, as a young boy his uh, parents who were farmers didn't want him to study so just to go against their wishes he got his his bachelor's degree and then you know so he was very he basically distracted himself into studying such that he didn't he wanted to rebel against his parents and uh, dr marker russell when he uh, was completing his phd uh, he was told that he needs to take a few more courses in physical chemistry although he had you know published a lot of papers uh, in jacks by then uh, I, when his phd advisor told him that he said that's a waste of time i'm not going to do it and he just left his phd so that's the kind of man we are talking about he was very rebel uh, by nature and then he joined rockefeller institute as a research chemist there he started working on progesterone uh, and again it was mainly to create molecules for these fancy breed horses uh, such that the the horse breeders can have these really exotic breeds uh, made now marker knew that uh, these molecules are very very in minute quantity in animals so he started looking at plant based steroids he thought of some other uh, plants like foxglove and sarsaparilla which are uh, very rich in these steroid molecules they have modified steroid molecules but they have it in large quantities much larger than the animals and uh, uh, but again uh, you see what happened was the the rockefeller institute the plant chemistry was under uh, pharmacology department whereas marker was uh, you know working under chemistry department and he didn't have the authority or the permission to work with plants so again he quit the job he moved to penn state because he was sure that he can figure out uh, a way to work with the plant steroids and really create the kind of molecule that the progesterone molecule that they wanted to create and uh, at penn state college he came up with this synthesis so what is this synthesis so first of all you have uh, uh, this sarsaparillin which you have taken out from the sarsaparilla which basically is a plant steroid it has a, sh- a sugar unit attached to this particular molecule sarsaparogenin okay and what a uh, marker knew that if i have this glycosidic bond here if you put it in acid uh, or with the help of some enzymes you can break that bond and separate the sugar units from uh, the particular nucleus uh, the particular skeleton up top so that's what he did he was able to figure, you know separate the uh, sarsaparillin such that you got this particular skeleton here which looks very similar to a steroids skeleton because you do have these three rings in place you do have that five membered ring in place you also have the methyls and the oh in place so he was very much on the right track and uh, then you can separate the sugar units which was basically some glucose and some raminose molecules okay so after that he came up with this marker degradation and this is a process that is even used now so it's a, a process that was thought then but now even now the steroid hormone industry all over the world does use a part of this or a modified uh, version of this so what do we do now so we have this sarsaparogenin and we want to figure out how to get rid of this part right uh, how do i do that so if you look at this this uh, particular end here sorry uh, this is an acetal okay and marker knew that acetals are inert in basic conditions but if you treat it with acids they break down so he basically ended up uh, you know creating this pyran ring here in the first step then he is going to oxidatively open it with chromium cro3 and you are going to get ester and a ketone here so you are going to open it oxidatively oxidative opening to form an ester and a ketone bond okay by the way the first step also uh, protects this oh so as you treat it with acetic anhydride you are going to also uh, sorry acetic acid you are also going to uh, protect that oh uh, the next step you are going to break this particular 
ester so esters he knew that they can get hydrolyzed very easily uh, now he does this hydrolysis in the pre presence of ethanolic NaOH okay now what is that ethanolic NaOH going to do that ethanolic NaOH is going to do multiple things first of all it's going to break this uh, ester linkage here and it is also going to form the double bond okay uh, because it's going to do an elimination reaction later and this particular OAC here will be converted back to OH. Okay, so he did, does multiple transformations, three trans transformations really, with just one step with NaOH that is ethanolic. After that, in the fourth step, what he's going to do is, he's going to, okay, so we are very close to uh, you know, progesterone now. If you look at this, uh, we have this double bond here, which needs to be, hydrogenated so that's what the fourth step does and the fifth step will convert this OH here uh, the very characteristic uh, OH uh, that you know that we uh, basically this was protected it became deprotected in step three uh, now in the fifth step that OH is going to become uh, oxidized and this is a selective oxidation of a secondary alcohol uh, open air oxidation really creating that C double bond O and as a result of it in just four or five steps he was able to figure out how to get from large quantities of that particular molecule uh, that was found in plants to progesterone so he was able to create progesterone in large quantities after that he moved to Mexico so he, he, Again, it, this is where his, uh, you know, the rebellious nature comes in place because he found that some yams in Mexico called dyscoria, uh, they have this particular molecule uh, in a huge quantity, much more than the, what was found in Fox Glow and Sarasapilla. Uh, so that's why he decided to move to Mexico. Now, moving to Mexico was not an easy step because it was World War II time, it was 1942. And during that time, uh, most US companies did not either want to work from Mexico or did not want to believe that a company can survive in Mexico. There was a lot of shortage of trained chemists at that time. But Mark, uh, you know, Russell Marker being uh, the kind of person he was, he decided, okay, I will go and I will start working. And that's where he established this particular company, Syntex. And Syntex later on came up with multiple molecules, okay, and uh, some of them I've uh, written here. So uh, the the one important molecule that Syntex can could come up with was cortisone, and cortisone for that they actually uh, took help of microbiological uh, oxidation. So they took help of some mold, wherein this particular position at C11 they could oxidize selectively. And this was done uh, at Syntex. Later on, Syntex grew to be one of the major uh, steroid, uh, you know, making companies in the world. And Carl Gerasi here uh, is also termed as the father of the pill because Carl Gerasi not only came up with this way of creating cortisone, he later on figured out so many different variations of this particular molecule, progesterone molecule, that uh, he had a library of compounds. And one of them, this norethin drone was very, very promising, okay? So, uh, Carl Gerasi and Marker are both termed uh, father of the pill, or rather Carl Gerasi is very often termed as the father of the pill. And uh, although both of them later on revealed that nowhere in their entire journey, nowhere in the whole journey, they thought that this pill was for humans. They were always thinking about this pill being used uh, by or, or the medicine or the drug molecule that they were really working on to be used by animals or either some particular really, really small fraction of women who had particular problems in their reproductive health. So nowhere they thought that this is going to be such a big thing. And for that, we have to actually th thank two women, okay, who are termed as the mothers of the pill. So uh, Catherine McCormick, and Margaret Sanger. They were the two women activists at that time. So as remember, as I said that uh, we didn't have control uh, or women didn't have control over when to give birth. 
okay then that was really scary and these two women were uh, you know kind of vouching for the women rights saying that you know the women should be in control of their reproductive health they should have access to birth control measures and in fact these two were really wealthy uh, they put in more than 15 million dollars uh, into development of the pill and because they were women they believed in giving that power to women they they thought that you know any women should be able to decide when to give birth or not and uh, they met at a medical conference once uh, catherine mccormick by the way was one of the first women to get a degree in biology from mit and uh, they met at a medical conference and um, there the these two doctors gregory uh, pinkus and john rock they were both present uh, they were talking about women's reproductive health and uh, they margaret and catherine basically challenged these two doctors that come up with a pill that is as safe as aspirin so something that a woman can take that will not harm her and but can uh, you know help her uh, really take control of her life and uh, gregory pinkus about him he was uh, the first uh he was from a lab that believed for the first time that animal processes had a chemical basis so even complex phenomena right like uh, reproduction could be understood through reactions and equations so he was the first one to really believe that and after that john rock who was uh, also a gynecologist who believed in uh, a lot about women empowerment so when all these people came together they came up with nor ethanodrel so now if you see this is very similar to carl jarassi's molecule if you look at this there is only a the difference of a double bond position so let me go back sorry uh, if i can just show it with a pointer here uh, there is only the difference of position of this double bond but this carbon carbon triple bond the oh everything is very much similar to the molecule that jarassi had developed in syntax so while uh, you know working with uh, various molecules they tried these molecules on different uh, animals mainly rabbits in uh, massachusetts and they figured out that this particular uh, molecule norethanodrel was actually really really effective in stopping the uh, female from ovulating such that she can control uh, or she she is in control of her uh, reproductive health there was a problem though massachusetts at that time did not allow uh, any kind of trials regarding uh, birth control measures so remember as i said that it was not uh, legal to have even talks on birth control measures leave alone that you can't i mean you can for them to try something in massachusetts it would be really really difficult because even telling women about birth control pills would be illegal and they would be jailed immediately so at that time how do you really figure out if these pills are safe for women and uh, they came up with the pill it was called as enovid uh, unfortunately they couldn't try it Uh, you know in massachusetts because it was illegal they tried it at the uh, at another state puerto rico now puerto rico was a very poor state the women over there were very poor they knew that uh, what the value of a birth control pill was because if a woman has four kids to feed he she surely understands why it is good to have not have the fifth kid but here is the catch this was one of the uh, this particular experiment the puerto rico experiment as it is called it was one of the most unethical trials because these women who participated in the puerto rico experiment from uh, this particular state they were uh, very poor they were illiterate they did not understand the meaning of taking that pill they just thought that by taking the pill i'm going to stop giving birth and that was the 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 understanding but really the other effects or side effects of consuming the pill uh, having an informed consent was not done with th- these women nonetheless because puerto rico state had different laws than massachusetts state they could conduct this experiment in this uh, state more than 2000 women participate 
participated and it was a success thankfully it was a success because uh, only less than 1% of it uh, of them were really you know uh, were giving births even after con- uh, you know consuming the pill so this was a major success uh, as an experiment later on we modified the pill now the enovid that was initially uh, you know made was had a large amount of norethinodrel now we have much safer pills that don't have as much side effects and if we really look at the big picture uh, in 1957 enovid was approved by fda in 1964 uh, 6.5 million women were consuming it today more than 100 million women consume it but if you look at even bigger picture the birth rate uh, so in the in the countries where the birth control pill was available for females uh, the birth rate has dropped there are more women who have entered education there are more women in the workforce so they are uh, you know you find women all over now they are in politics they are in various uh, you know professions you have them starting you know from our astronauts to doctors to various other professions you see them because they were able to control their life and there is much more awareness openness and opportunity that is given to these women all because of a single molecule so um, why was the birth control pill not developed for men <laughs> so that's a that's a very uh, interesting question to ask in fact uh, there was Uh, uh, there were a few molecules that were developed uh, but since men don't have a, a hormone cycle like the females it becomes very difficult for uh, you know to really come up with a molecule that works well although there are molecules that are in trial but nonetheless uh remember always look at the bigger picture how the discovery of a single molecule has changed the world around us in just a few decades we are seeing so much more effect of this one single molecule that was developed and so if anybody uh says that chemistry questions are boring or chemistry questions are not challenging or uh, you know they don't they are only present in the lab uh, that you work in remember they have a much wider effect on the on the human population or or our entire environment and don't stop asking questions thank you yeah so that was the end of my talk uh, if anybody has questions i would be very happy to discuss them thank you madam for your enriching presentation i have learned many a thing from your lecture i was just because i was just recalling the concept of marker degradation i think that he had two co workers with him one was uh, scientist layman and the other one was scientist yes. somlo and initially marker was at the ethyl corporation then he moved to syntex ca so it was yes. a wonderful presentation now now the forum is open to questions participants who wish to present their questions to the speakers may do so by typing them in the chat box section Is there any question? I had uh, quite a bit of fun reading about the history while preparing the talk. Actually, yes, yes. <laughs> so it was a wonderful uh, presentation. Actually, actually, students need to understand these scientific backgrounds. that uh, how a particular con- uh, concept has evolved over the time so these backgrounds are very much needed yeah any question from the participants it's it's ironic because the talk was about asking questions <laughs> anyways uh, if you have a question you can always approach me i have i'll type my uh, email here so it's okay. neeraja at icerpune.ac.in uh, please approach and ask questions we would be very happy to you know converse later on if if you want to think and ask a question that's also fine thank you madam thank, thank you. you we have learned many things from you and thank you for accepting our request and for all of your supports thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Please take care.
Thank you. Uh, the second speaker of today is Professor Unupa Kumbhar, Madam. Uh, Madam uh, obtained her PhD degree from the University of Pune in the year 2002. Uh, she worked as CSIR RA during the tenure 2002-2003. Madam was awarded Fast Track Project for Young Scientists by DST uh, during 2004-2007. to After that, uh, she served as a lecturer in the Department of Chemistry, University of Pune for a year before joining as a regular faculty in the university in the year 2008. Madam carried out her postdoctoral research at Duke University, USA under Voice Cursed Fellowship conferred by DST Government of India. Madam is the examination board member for Indian Chemistry Olympiads conducted by Umi Bhabha Center for Science Education, TIFR Mumbai, since 2016. She was a member of Indian delegation to International Chemistry Olympiad held in Thailand in the year 2017 as a scientific observer. Member of study group, Bal Bharati Chemistry Textbook for Standard 12, member of Board of Studies, Chemistry, SP College, Pune and Pratap College. She has over 42 publications in peer-reviewed national and international journals. Four students have been awarded PhD degree and two are currently working under Madam's supervision. The Madam's research group at SP Pune University is engaged in the synthesis of fluorophore labeled metal complexes for bioimaging as probes for cellular organelles, investigating their photochemistry, metal-based antibacterial agents, and development of sensors for environmental and biosensing applications using absorption, emission, lifetime measurements. Electrochemical, EPR, confocal microscopy, and single crystal X-ray diffraction techniques he also uses. May I now welcome our beloved Professor Unupa Kumbhar, Madam, to deliver this session. Madam, please. Thank you. Thank you, Amrit. Thank uh, you, ma'am for the introduction. And uh, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, Association of Chemistry Teachers and um, uh, Singur College for giving me this opportunity to interact with the students in this uh, current pandemic situation. This, I think, is a very good platform because even if we are not able to communicate uh, meet physically, we can still uh, communicate through uh, uh, this virtual platform. And uh, this is one of uh, good um, workshops, I would say, that is uh, organized by Dr. Amrit Mitra because he has earlier organized many workshops on different topics. So I really appreciate your efforts in uh, taking the chemistry forward and uh, dissipating the knowledge. Uh, uh, so uh, with that, I would like to start with uh, my presentation. And... Uh, Yes. The earlier speaker, Dr. Niraja, she has set the standards high. Okay, it has been, it will be very difficult for me now to keep you engaged um, because I do not have any stories to share with you or I would not be walking through you from the history to the present. Uh, conditions, but definitely I would try to uh, share with you the importance of uh, practicals in understanding the theory. So, yes. Can you see the screen? Yes. 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 So the Perfect. title is, um, huh, I have chosen is like, uh, are practicals impractical? So how important the practicals are in the curriculum, be it biology, be it engineering, or like basic uh, sciences, uh, chemistry, physics, mathematics, or there are practicals in languages. Initially, I used to wonder, what kind of projects they would be doing in arts faculty, uh, history, languages, uh, geography and all, right? So, unless and until we have that feeling of the practicals, um, we do not 
get enriched that is what i would say and what is mean by enrichment is uh, just understanding or having the theoretical knowledge does not solve the purpose of facing the world there are different situations different uh, the conditions that we would be facing in our day to day life and unless and until we find the solutions to those problems our problems are not going to be solved and that is where the importance of practicals comes into picture so this is a small cartoon i got uh, from the internet uh, which shows a picture of this girl uh, and the um, the same girl first uh, who is trying to solve a problem based on the her theoretical learning right so the uh, you look at her face don't you see that she is confused or tensed right why because she is not able to understand how to approach the problem in hand how to solve it because there is a lot of information that is stuffed into the literature in the theory and she is not able to correlate it to the problem in hand and in theory what we do we uh, um, start mugging up and most of the times the aim of the students is to pass the examination right than to get understanding about the subject and that creates a strain on the memory and which leads to a confused state of mind and subsequently it would lead to frustration and uh, when that comes in the, there is a negativity about the subject so the student starts disliking the subject okay so that is about the theoretical learning now come to the right hand side picture okay now here you see the same girl who is very happy open look at her uh, body language also because that is reflecting the confidence she has okay she has an open gesture her, there is an excitement that is shown on her face why it is so she is feeling happy right and you see an abacus uh, in front of her so that means she is doing something on that and i think that is kind of pendulum and she is uh, moving it okay and then she is understanding yes this could have been a particular thing that is happening okay that is been talked in the theory right so that means she is more enthusiastic about learning because of the conceptual clarity that she is getting by performing a a uh, practical or an experiment so that is the importance of practical in our life i would give an example uh, in a daily life right it is said that a good chemist uh, can be a good, good cook or vice versa a good cook must be a good chemist why it is so because when we cook we are processing the chemicals which are present in the food stuff and if the ingredients are added in the right amount always the dish would be very tasty right so that means we are giving exposure to uh, uh, that food uh, for a certain period of time we are exposing it to a heat certain amount of heat and then uh, the the molecules they are released from the food stuff and they create an aroma right and that triggers the um hunger or the feeling okay increases appetite so this is the effect of practical learning apart from that there are other benefits that we get from the laboratory work so so what are the benefits first it develops better understanding of the theoretical concepts that we learn in the classroom and it deals with real life situations and application oriented always so unless and until so only theoretical knowledge is not important how to apply that knowledge is very very important i think it is the most important because it helps in problem solving and critical thinking skills so if someone is uh, constructing a bridge 
okay what are the materials that are uh, used in construction we use cement we use uh, um, sand right and they are mixed in definite proportion and water is added to it and that mixture is used in cementing the bricks right and it is not just there we stop but if you have observed carefully these workers they sprinkle the water unless and until that is set why it is so why that process has to be done you must have observed the same phenomena when the construction of roads the concrete roads are is there right so what is the role of water isn't it so unless and until this is all given in the theory but unless and until we apply it they it will not fix in our mind and then the tension would be gone because we have understood what exactly is going on in there right and if such situation arises in the future we can apply this experience and solve the problem in hand immediately so that reduces everything the tension the financial burden and the efficacy of the work increases many times in the construction in your homes also you might see the cracks uh, which are developed in the um walls why is it so why because during the construction after uh, keeping the bricks one on another and cementing it the curing of the cement has not been done properly that means the water was not sprinkled properly what do you mean by curing that one needs to understand we are learning these words right so uh, this is the process that helps us decipher the meaning of the words that we use without understanding them in uh, theory classes okay so that is one of the um a uh, big thing uh, practical solves or that that is uh, the major purpose of after that i would say practicals motivates the teamwork and conceptual understanding that is just what i said motivates teamwork yes obviously you are going to live in the society right and unless and until there is a teamwork you cannot work in isolation you cannot be in isolation forever or you can be you cannot be your own boss and would say that um, it has to be done the way i do or i preach no so it has to be through discussions so unless and until we establish the connections between the people with whom you are working the progress will not be there in any project whether it is the laboratory project a scientific project or it is a project where you are dealing with some social uh, problems right so uh, the practical motivates this team work and understanding here it does not stop when we perform a practical we record some readings right so that is what we call as the data collection but collection does not have any meaning unless and until we analyze that data interpret it and try to understand what exactly is happening in such uh, condition or in a particular system under investigation and it doesn't stop there also we need to represent that that data we have to share it we have to publish it so when we are communicating our work it it does not have just the text because as just mucking up the theory is boring reading through text is also boring right and there if we represent the data pictorially it attracts the attention of the reader and data representation in the form of figures would give you a lot of information that requires less words in the text okay and this representation can be as i said in in the form of a figure or a graph or you must have some of you might have gone for some conferences or have attended online conferences in in uh, last two years right so there you must have seen that data are represented in some data are given in bar diagrams there are some pie charts there are some line charts okay 
why in what situation one needs to use a particular representation okay there is poster presentation not always everyone would get a chance to present their work orally but there is a poster presentation that is also a skill so how to organize your data in a particular format so that it can be communicated it passes the information can be passed through the audience very clearly so the listener will have an, an understanding of entirely new thing okay so you are a mediator so here language also plays an important role and then this is important obviously when you are performing a practical in the lab you are seeing a change in the conductance with respect to increase in temperature or you are change you are seeing the change in the color due to addition of a ligand to a metal salt and there would be formation of different colors or you can um uh, have different materials having different properties like the fluorescence of the compound would be different it would change right if we change the pi donor ability of the ligand okay so why it is so all these properties are observed through the practicals or through the demonstrations okay these are called as macroscopic properties but what happens or what actually is going on in the microscopic level that one needs to understand and unless and until we have that understanding we are not able to explain what exactly is happening over there okay so in nutshell i would say uh, like there are plenty of benefits of laboratory work i might have missed few things but these are uh, uh, what i thought are the major things one uh, would get benefited from uh, by performing the laboratory uh, practicals and therefore the practical work has immense importance in our curriculum okay so here i would again share a story with you there was an engineer very accomplished person had very high grades in his graduation and uh, he got a very good job also and 10 years in the job he had got a, a very nice uh, bungalow he bought a, a, hand, a fancy car and one day he was driving his car going in the ne neighboring um a village or district okay and suddenly his car stopped he got down of the car checked everything he opened the machine opened the bonnet looked at the engine looked at the water everything he checked and he was puzzled oh i don't see any fault anywhere then why my car is not working and just so there was a peasant passing by and he said saab ji can i help you what is the problem he said my stop suddenly started uh, moving then he said have you checked the petrol tank okay so what does that mean it means that even if you are a very learned person a very accomplished person having great um a uh, percentiles okay or having a bright performance does not mean that you have a practical knowledge or an ability to think about various things which are responsible for uh, uh solving the problem in hand how simple that problem was or in fact that would have been a first thought that would have come into his mind oh have i fill the petrol before uh, starting let me check the petrol tank and that would have solved his problem okay saved his time and agony right so 
Now we are in an, an unprecedented situation. This is a pandemic. Okay. And what this pandemic has taught us. What we are looking at now, the vaccine, it has come out in two years. And how many people are vaccinated worldwide? No, and they are getting vaccinated. And how many types of vaccines have come into the market? Right? One is RNA based. One is based on attenuated virus. One is based on uh, our DRDO people have come up with a very novel idea. Okay? They are using D-glucose. What does that mean? That means innovation is at its peak. Why? Because now whatever knowledge they have acquired during so many years of their services, they are applying it. And it is not in solo. Okay? Whatever skill sets they have acquired, they are implementing it in collaboration. And that is why the vaccine has come into the market so fast. Otherwise, it would have taken minimum six years. Minimum, I would say. Five to six years. Right? So, what this pandemic has taught us Certain skills, skill sets are very essential for understanding and finding out solutions and executing and coming, uh, coming up with the products, which will solve the problem. And for this, collaborations are essential. We, it also has taught us to care for the environment. Why? Because you might have read the newspaper that the pollution levels have dropped down tremendously. The water quality has improved and the, the aquatic life also has improved. Right? It also has taught us how to use the resources judicially. Now, in the last year, it was a very bad situation. The food grains, fruits, medical stuff, all that was in uh, not available in plenty because of constraints, isn't it? So it has taught us to use it judicially. Innovative thinking, you might have uh, read or you might have seen an advertisement on the uh, television about a kit. So you don't need to go to the hospital to uh, confirm whether you are COVID positive or not. Don't need to go for RT-PCR test. Within 30 minutes sitting at home, it will tell you whether you are COVID positive or not. Right? So that has created many startups. Okay? Now it has also taught us how to be um, um, what you say, um, creative in building the infrastructures for healthcare facilities, hospitality, and humanity. And it has also taught us that henceforth such challenges are going to come and we need to prepare this generation to face such challenges. Okay? And how? Because you are not able to go physically on the campus. You are sitting at home. The teachers are delivering the theoretical knowledge online. But is it, is it solving the purpose? So that is a, there is a great impact on teaching learning methodologies. Okay. And the academic performance of the student. So online teaching we are doing, but how much we are able to keep the students engaged during the lectures? We are not able to see the faces. Okay. So there is a verbal communication only happening between us. Nonverbal communication through gestures huh, is also very crucial to understand whether a person who is sitting across is able to understand what you are conveying or what you are trying to convey. 
right? So we are coming up with many innovative uh, ways to keep the students engaged. That is also not sufficient because we have time constraint. We have constraint on the syllabus, so-called syllabus that has to be covered. We are not paying attention to the conceptual understanding. Okay, all are running the race. And in this scenario, last year, the practicals did not happen at all. And as I mentioned, there are plenty of advantages of these practicals. And unless and until you do things on your own, you will not understand where are the difficulties, how to overcome them, how to go for perfection or achieve for perfection. Right? So, people are um, trying to conduct the practicals by virtually virtu uh, making some softwares, giving them the feel. At least we provide them the data. Data analysis skill also can be developed by virtual laboratory practicals. But is it just uh, 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 needed? No. So the question arises, are these virtual laboratory practicals are as effective as the physical practicals? Right? And I started thinking, the students are at loss and they are missing on a lot of things. The greatest thing is real-time experience. Right? So going to the laboratory, and as soon as you enter the lab, there is a peculiar smell. And you can understand, oh, there is a smell of chlorine. Madam, I smell uh, H2S gas. Is there any leakage or is there anything rotten? Why? This is also required when you are performing the practice. What you are doing? You are connecting the things, the smell to the perception, right? What is the perception? That particular smell or that peculiar smell comes because of rotting. What happens when a particular thing wrapped rottens? Uh, H2 and H2S gas is evolved, right? So it is the smell of that. But unless and until you experience it, you would not be able to tell. You are missing on handling the chemicals, having those feels, okay? Looking at the colorful solutions that you would be making, the pungent smell, the sweet smell, all those kind of things. And you are missing on handling the equipments. And when you are performing a practical, lot of things happen. Let me take a simple example of a titration, acid-based titration. And what you do that, uh, what you do in there, you add an indicator and see the color change. Right? So what you are doing, you are observing a macroscopic property that is color, which is changing. And we say that it is because of change in the um, pH of the solution. But what exactly is happening in that particular conical flask? We do not know. What is the um, indicator that you are using? Okay. What is the structure of that indicator? What will happen when a pH is changed? What do you mean by pH? A change in concentration of H plus science or OH minus science, what effect that will have on the structure of the indicator? Whether there would be change in the conjugation that is reflected in the color or decolorization of that. Right? So, the correlation of that macroscopic property to the microscopic property is missing and that is where the major understanding of the theoretical concepts would occur. And interaction of peers, yes, that is also important because when you perform a practical, you discuss with your friends, okay? And through discussions also, learning happens. So now I'm eagerly waiting for the students to come on the campus. 
the, whenever we talk online they said that madam when when are we going to open okay we want to come and perform this is not giving us the feel of performing the practical today we had project presentation without conducting a single practical they gave the project presentation okay so they were given a research paper and they had to present that research paper right they presented it applying the theoretical knowledge that they had learned during all these years right from schooling i'm saying okay and interpreting the data that others have published it is again a skill set that is required so i am not saying that the learning is not happening okay that is there but when you look at something it will create an impact on your mind you don't need to mug up okay so what are presentations they have made they have been uh, uh benefited but not i would say completely because when they would come to the lab do some synthesis they would know what are the parameters that are to be controlled why did these parameters are need to be controlled which solvent is appropriate which is giving me higher yields what are the color changes why these color changes happen what is the temperature i need to do uh, need to maintain in order to carry out this reaction whether to use an oil bath or a water bath okay if it is a solid state synthesis or nanoparticles whether to use a top down approach or bottom up bottom up approach what does that mean they they are using these words but they are not aware of the meaning okay what is calcination what does it do how a particular solvent is changing the structural morphology of the nanoparticles that are being synthesized in the lab yes that is missing isn't it so therefore i would say or my emphasis henceforth would be on performing a practical and how one can do that how many concepts can be developed by performing a single project uh, or a practical or a small practical which would not need hands and fancy equipments would not need lot of time but it would bring in a better understanding about a very boring or very uh, tedious to understand Mm, concept okay so whatever i have listed over here that we are missing that is the purpose of the practicals that they serve now what i said practicals and in are an integral part to bridge the gap between the problem solving and the theoretical knowledge okay and therefore it is immensely important to design such practicals which are very easy to perform but would bring in better understanding of the topics which are difficult to understand otherwise in a class so can we can we uh can we have those theoretical concepts transferred into the practicals and engage the students in hands on activity and when they do that i would say the the understanding would be better much better so this is one such experiment that i came across which is recently published okay Th there is no page number also that has been assigned to this article which is published in journal of chemical education now look at the title it is rhodium rainbow a colorful laboratory experiment now why i have chosen this experiment right because this highlights the ligand field effects of a dirhodium tetraacetate again i would say it is not just the ligand field effects i am going to talk about 
look at the complex that uh, these people have chosen it is a dirodium complex where there is a metal metal bond present over there there are few papers that are already published in the, it is available in the literature okay they are talking about the ligand field effects but essentially they are talking about the first row transition elements which are mononuclear complexes okay so this is the first one where a dinuclear complex with a metal metal bond has been used to explain the ligand field effects okay so whenever we perform a practical we enter the lab we need to understand what are the chemicals that we are going to deal with how safe they are what are the precautions that one needs to take when we handle these uh, chemicals and then once i'm done with the experiment how i will dispose these this is a very very important parameter i would say and there are charts pasted on the walls of the laboratory we don't even bother to go and check what is the meaning of a particular symbol and when you are handling the bottles you are weighing the chemicals you are not paying attention on the labels where such um uh pictures are or the symbols are displayed okay so be observant when you are performing performing a practical be observant right from the beginning whether the spatula is wet or dry from that point whether the apparatus are clear or not whether there is anything sticking in uh, inside the walls of my beaker is the burette marking proper whether the tip of the burette is broken all those things also are very essential in getting the perfect or what i would say um accurate measurements right we need to understand what is the minimum uh count of the apparatus that you are using okay what is the accuracy so the first thing we need to pay attention to is the hazard and how to handle okay so first you have to refer to the msds data sheet that is the material safety data sheet it is highly recommended okay so it will give you an information about the hazard based on the pictogram that is displayed okay and it will give you the composition or the information on the ingredients that are there in the bottle okay and the hazard category it is an irritant and it will cause an irritation to eyes and respiratory system it, as well as the skin it will give you the chemical abstract service number and what is the purity by weight in percentage of the chemical that is there in the bottle and it will also give an information about the disposal now this msds data is for rhodium acetate dimer which we are going to use in this particular practical again that msds data sheet will give you the precautions safe uh, safe handling precautions and recommendations for storage because more many times you have seen we are in a tropical region there are fluctuations okay now it it is a monsoon and there is a lot of humidity and if you are opening a bottle of a hygroscopic chemical they have a tendency to absorb this moisture and then if you do not co properly cover it or seal it okay it will turn into liquid now madam this has turned into liquid why why in the first place it is the very simple thing it has absorbed the moisture and is now started dissolving itself it is liquefying because of that right so such small things one needs to keep in mind while storing the particular chemical that we are uh, using on daily basis in the laboratory again the physical and chemical properties also one need to look into and 
the stability and reactivity of the chemicals that we are using how long that particular chemical would be stable in the form in the uh, that particular form okay is it going to get de decomposed when i keep it outside in the window sill where it is exposed to the sunlight right so msds data sheet a reference is always an important thing okay so uh, there are uh, these things one needs to uh, go through before starting the practical okay now there is a pre lab also that means we expect a student to know few basic things that Uh, they have learnt in theory. So based on that, there may be a small questionnaire that we would give you before you start with the experiment, just to understand how uh, much is the conceptual understanding, or are there any misconceptions? Okay, and there would be a discussion, and then only the students should start. performing the practical that means weighing the chemicals preparing the solutions and then uh, go ahead okay so here the title of the paper says that it is highlighting the ligand field effects of dirhodium tetraacetate and when we uh, and this is this is in undergraduate second year okay uh, crystal field theory ligand field theory right and uh we talk about these theories first and then we go to spectrochemical series what i would feel is that if we demonstrate the spectrochemical series to the students before going to the theory class the understanding of the theoretical concept would be much better okay so um this spectrochemical series was first proposed in 1938 and that was again based on the observations observations of differences in the colors of octahedral co cobalt complexes on addition of some ligands and that is also reflected in the uh, uv visible spectra okay so with each colored solution the spectrum that they, they have obtained had shifted okay and then they started wondering what must have been happening inside the solution because uh the ligands are different moon we have halides like chloride fluoride chloride bromide iodide then we have um these are all monodentic ligands then we have water which acts as a ligand we have hydroxide which is derived from water right and then we have uh, sulfates nitrates phosphates acetates we have ammonia right we have different amines we have different esters ethers thioethers we have acids we have alcohols we have dyes where we have azo um, or nn double bond okay and then we also have um, uh, these uh, ketonic and aldehydic uh, compounds right now each one will have a different property in the sense they have different number of electrons look at the structure of the molecule is there a pi conjugation under what condition you are doing this practical okay is it in the aqueous medium is it in a particular solvent is the solvent that you are using is a coordinating solvent like dmf dmso ethanol methanol acetonitrile lthf etc or it is a non coordinating solvent like benzene toluene dichloromethane chloroform right whether it is a polar protic solvent or polar polar aprotic solvent whether it is dense highly dense or not right so what i have done here i have talked about many chemicals the solvents are also chemicals right and then i am not going into the depth because of the time constraints 
I am directly giving you the spectrochemical series which is established, and this does not cover all the ligands. Let me tell you. Okay, so this is pertaining to the practical that I am the most or I am uh, I am discussing with you right now. So the the ligands are uh, segregated as pi donor ligands. Only sigma donors. We have pi acceptor ligands, right? And here the arrow indicates that the pi donor ligands are weak ligands. Okay, and then the pi acceptor ligands are the stronger ligands. Right now, what is the effect of the strength of these ligands? What do we mean by strength of the ligands? Right. So halides, thiocyanate, azide, hydroxide, these are weaker ligands. They are easily dissociable and are replaced. Okay. Now. When we talk about weaker ligands, we need to look into the theory then. Because when you are performing a practical and add a sodium chloride and look at the color, oh, it is not changing. Huh? Let me add uh, bromide. Ah, there is slight change, but it is not that strong. Maybe it is because of the uh, bromide solution. I don't know what is happening over there. Right? Then you add ammonia. Oh, so nice color I'm getting. See, 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 you, you just go on displaying that. Okay. Then you add acetyl acetone if it is present over there. Because you are curious to know now more about what is happening or what will happen if I add this and I add that. Because it is uh, 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 at my disposal. It is there uh, in the lab. Okay. So when we do that, we get plenty of colors. Now... I will restrict to four um, ligands, chloride, then water, ammonia, okay, I would remove water, ammonia, and um, cyanide is poisonous. So. I will go for amine then, huh? And then acetyl acetonate, I would add to that. I will add oxalate also. Write down. So chloride, then ammonia, then bipyridine or phenanthrolin. Uh, then acetyl acetone. Let me stick to these four. Now look at this. This is a monodentate ligand. This is again a monodentate ligand. Bipyridine, if you know the structure, it is the bipyridine. Okay. Right, it is a neutral donor, but bidentate ligand. So I have bidentate ligand. ACAC, it is acetyl acetonate. Okay, I would. I would write OH over here. Okay, let it be. Or you can draw a double bond over there. Acetyl acetonate, right? It is a bidentate ligand. What I'm talking about now, when we are talking about the spectrochemical series here, it is not just the pi donor and sigma donor ability, but also we need to understand the density. Okay, that is that is making the picture more complicated. So uh, I'm just giving you a future direction. Uh, if you in future uh, enter in the lab, and perform some practical. So, on what or in what direction one must uh, keep thinking? Okay. So, weaker ligands, there is no pair of electrons and would always result in the high spin complex. And stronger ligands would result in electron pairing and would lead to low spin complexes. 
So what do you mean by pairing of electrons? So this is the uh, d orbital splitting diagram of uh, um, one d4 system. So here the d orbitals initially are degenerate. That means they all have equal energy. And therefore, if you remember, they are drawn like this in one line, right? So the degenerate orbitals means they have equal energy. And this energy is perturbed and it is split into two sets of d orbitals, which are then denoted as D2G and EG sets of orbitals. Okay, and these are dxy, dxz, and dyz orbitals, and these are d um, x square and d uh, dz square and dx square minus y square orbitals. Okay, now look at this. When we have four electrons, we have two possibilities. The electron may pair up in the ground state. Uh, with this T2 uh, in the T2G orbital, or it may go up and occupy the higher energy orbital. Now, what decides that the uh, the electron would pair up or would go in another or, uh, orbital? When the energy that is required to pair up is small it would remain in T2G orbital, would prefer pairing, okay? And when the energy required for pairing is greater than going to the higher orbital, the electron would jump to the higher EG orbital. And that is given by delta octahedral. So because we are talking about an, an octahedral system, Okay, and if the metal ion has a noble gas configuration and have no unpaid electrons, the solution will appear colorless. Can you give me an example of this? Right, zinc to ions. When we prepare their solutions, they are mostly colorless. At the most, we have uh, the complexes of zinc in pale yellow, pale orange color. Not beyond that. Most of the zinc compounds are colorless. Why? It is because of this. Okay. So when we are talking about the colors, it is related to the, these transitions. Okay. And these transitions are dependent on the strength of the ligand. Okay. Why? Because if the ligand is weak, it is not going to split these D or battles of the metal ion drastically. Okay, and if the ligand field is stronger, it is going to affect the D or battles. Okay, and that is reflected. So, this is a color wheel you might have seen from 12th standard. Okay, what it does, it, it gives a, a, a range of wavelengths and a color. Okay. So, we know that the wavelength and frequency of a wave are inversely proportional. Wavelength and frequency, right? And when we look at the absorbance, absorbance, we plot an absorption spectrum. On y-axis, we have absorption. On x-axis, what we have? Wavelength. Right. Now, when that is there, What we say? UV visible spectroscopy. Okay. And we say that the transitions that we see in the UV region are higher in energy than the transitions we see here at higher wavelengths that are lower in energy. That is reflected in the molar absorption coefficient values. Okay, and this information is very, very 
uh, important for us to find out or this information can give us a clue whether the ligand that is co combining with a metal to give a particular color is high spin or low spin. Uh, sorry, is a strong field or uh, uh, a weak field giving rise to a uh, uh, high spin or low spin complex. And we know from electromagnetic radiation, what is the range, okay? The blue region and the red region of the spectrum. So here, the color will shows all colors. And we also know that the color that is absorbed by the medium, the complementary color to that is reflected. And that is what we see. So if I say that a compound is absorbing red color, what the solution would appear? What would be the color of the solution? It would be blue green. If it is violet, the color we see is green. So if I give you a range or a particular wavelength, of, say 520 and 80, I would say 550 nanometer, the band would appear somewhere here, okay? So if the compound is absorbing the or having a lambda max at 550 nanometer, what would be the color of that complex? Right? So such correlations then become easier if you have the number of things that we start correlating. Okay? And then it would be easier for us to predict whether the complex that is getting formed is either high spin or low spin. Even if we do not know the ligand even if we do not know the ligand which is binding and forming the complex, okay? So that basic information can be drawn from this. So in this experiment, what new these people have demonstrated is application of a second row transition element. And this element is very, very important from the catalytic point of view. So we can predict the catalytic activities or we can design a better catalyst, okay? If we place a particular ligand or choose a particular ligand judiciously to tune the property of the complex, okay? Look at this now, I am, I am bringing in more concepts over here. I don't want to confuse you, but I just want to highlight that if you are doing a small practical, how much theoretical information you need to have beforehand, and the processing of that is occurring via visual um, uh, observations, okay, of the system under investigation. And another important parameter here I would like to bring into picture or highlight is the metal-metal bond. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the ligand field effect, okay, is brought in here with the help of molecules which are solvents not the so-called ligands as uh, we have defined earlier or have seen earlier, okay? I said that there are some solvents which, which are coordinating. They have a set of donor atoms. So whether binding of these solvents themselves are bringing out change in the, in the coordination environment of the metal, and that is reflected in the color and we are perceiving it in, in, in a totally different manner. To understand that, we need to have this information. And this information we will get only when we, we uh, practically uh, or we, 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 we perform this experiment in the lab. Right? So now look at the correlation. Okay. Look at the structure. The dirhodium acetate is a, is a polymer. We need to break it when it is available. Now. Most of the times, that, that is why we need to look at the label. Okay. 
uh, or uh, uh, the specifications of the chemicals when we order them. So the MSDS data sheet I have shown you is for specifically this uh, uh, dinuclear complex. Otherwise, this is available as a polymeric uh, complex and we need to break it and the breaking of that polymer happens like uh, can be done by dissolving that entire bottle into or whatever into ethanol and stir it vigorously and it would uh, uh, break down into a monomer okay but in doing so it may change the color it may change the color and you would say madam i have spoiled all this bottle of rhodium acetate what should i do no don't no no need to panic because if you know that this rhodium acetate has two axial sites vacant for ligand coordination and the solvent that you are using is a coordinating ligand that might have been responsible for this color change okay and that color change that is caused due to the solvents which are bound is called as solvatochromism and this again i can perceive as a ligand field effect because the solvent is acting as a ligand and that is reflected in the color change right so what is the property of the solvent now my ligand and here they have demonstrated that yes the solvents also can act as ligand and that can give you a rainbow uh, of colors again i would like to spend some time on uh, on on the uh, peculiarity of the structure of this molecule the highlight is metal metal sigma bond is there and this is due to the overlap of dz square orbital i am telling you just now because as i said no no uh, time uh, for great uh, in depth uh, discussions okay then we have pi bonds that can be formed by overlap of dx z and dyz orbitals and then we also have the overlap of two dxy orbitals leading to a delta bond now what do we mean by delta bond we have not come across any delta bond formation right so what what does that mean okay so here the uh, the molecular orbital uh, diagram for this rhodium complex is shown so uh, you have this z uh, the 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 sigma sigma bond that is formed between two rhodiums uh, uh, when the there is an overlap of uh, the z square orbit this this is what is just written over here and explained or shown here pictorially okay and here you see there is a delta bond that is formed now what is that it is the xy dxy orbital of both the rhodiums which are overlapping sideways okay and uh, such delta orbitals can also be formed when you have the x square minus y square orbitals but they are not available for binding okay let us see that in the next uh, slide so usually what we see here is the presence of metal metal delta bond yes we have metal metal pi bonds and we have a sigma bond so the splitting between an in phase sigma bonding orbital and its out of phase sigma star sigma star that is anti bonding that is why it is called as out of phase counterpart will be larger than the corresponding pi to pi star splitting okay and the delta to delta star transition or that splitting will be the smallest because it is low in energy that transition now that is important for us to understand the effect of solvent coordination to this metal complex or the metal uh, salt okay so this is uh, where i have explained the delta bond formation okay delta bond formation so when atomic orbitals from two parallel planes combine side by side huh? like uh, uh, i have shown you dx y orbitals a delta orbital is formed so when uh, they when there is a metal metal bond formation we say that there is a delta bond that is formed but only when 
there is a uh, matching of symmetry of the orbitals and there is a combination of parallel planes. Okay. As I mentioned, the dx square minus, uh, minus y square orbitals also has an ability to form the delta orbitals. However, it is not available for the metal to metal bond formation. Why? Because it is geometrically located where the four equatorial bridging acetate, bond, acetate groups are there. Right? So, therefore, when we are talking about the delta bond in this particular complex, it is, remember, because of the overlap of the XY orbitals on both metal centers. Okay. Having said that, we need to know the oxidation state of this also. Because based on that, we are going to uh, construct this uh, orbital diagram. Right? So the oxidation state tells us about the number of electrons that are present. They are available. Like, okay, and whether they are paired or not paired. So um, uh, that calculations I have shown here and I am skipping on that right now. And when we are talking about the delta bond formation, uh, I, I just uh, I thought that I would give you an additional information because that phenomena occurs in this um, um, iodine molecule also, and iodine also shows the solvatochromism. That means uh, uh, the color of iodine solution varies based on the solvent in which you dissolve it. Okay, so um, yes, now coming to our rainbow that is formed because of the rhodium acetate solution. And here you see, right from the red to the purple or violet, okay? Because perception of color is again a most important thing. So here you are adding sodium dithionate, then para sulfonyl methyl isocyanide, then you have, uh, sorry, uh, triphenylphosphine, para um, Sulfonyl methyl isocyanide, then benzaldehyde, you have ethanol and acetonitride. Okay, look at the colors. They are all different. And then what they have done? They have recorded the absorption spectra of all these solutions. And what you see here is the change in the lambda max values. And the lambda max values are different for each ligand or the solvent that is coordinated. Right? right from the absorption maximum at 450 nanometers, it is going up to 600 nanometers. Now, rhodium is a transition metal. So the first question that would come to mind, like Niruja has said, power of good questions, it helps us in understanding. Right? So this is because of what? Is it a DD transition? Is it, a is it a charge transfer? What is it? Okay, what we have learned is, we know only one thing, that color of the complex is because of D to D transition. The electrons present on the D metals, or the, the metals, transition metals, there is a transition from one D orbital to another D orbital as we have seen earlier. Is it just that? And if it is happening, would the absorbance be so conspicuous? Because we say that these are weaker transitions. Now here, the absorbance is 0.5. It is quite high. So is it a charge transfer? If it is a charge transfer, whether it is ligand to metal charge transfer or metal to ligand charge transfer, or whether it is just intra-ligand charge transfer, metal has no role to play. That is what happens in zinc complexes when I said uh, there, there are like uh, yellow colored or uh, uh, orange colored complexes of zinc where there is no D uh, or metal to ligand, uh, sometimes uh, ligand to metal charge transfer blocker. But still, what, what is there? Metal does not have any empty orbitals to accept those electrons. So the color of the complex would be more, more uh, uh, dependent on the intra-ligand transitions or charge transfers. So there are so many, so many types. How 
to conclude that this is because of a particular trans transition okay and then again we go back to our theory and take help of the established spectrochemical series though it is not for the solvents but it is based on the pi donor and uh, uh, sigma donor ability or pi acceptor ability of the or pi donor ability of the ligand okay so here in this case okay when you look at the uh, the molecular orbital diagram all these orbitals are filled there is only one empty orbital that is dz square sigma star orbital where the transition can occur of the electrons okay so what i see is the transition can occur from sigma star orbital to the pi uh, sorry pi star orbital to the sigma star orbital okay from dxz dyz orbitals to the um, z square orbital now here the ligands if you remember the structure of uh, 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 diiridium uh, tetraacetate uh, you see that the axial positions are vacant so the coordination obviously would be occurring from that that particular direction so if the ligand is a pi donor it would destabilize this rhodium rhodium sigma star as well as the pi star orbital okay and it would reduce the homolimo gap between the t2g set of orbitals and eg sets of orbitals now what will happen it will cause low energy transitions because homolimo gap is reduced right and the energy transitions would occur at longer wavelengths because low energy remember that longer wavelength lower energy right and similarly we can in, we can we can give explanation for the pure sigma donors now what they would do being sigma donors they would interact only with the sigma orbitals okay so sigma to sigma transition would be there there would be um uh what you see high energy gap and then the 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 peak would would be would be at lower wavelength and that is how you start correlating and it becomes simple for us to understand theoretical concepts and now further we are going to correlate this with the with the now we know the spectrochemical series we know the color will we know uh, wavelength right we know the ligands now it is easier for us to predict whether the compound that is formed is high spin or low spin okay so what are the learning outcomes that we have achieved by performing this simple experiment so it has allowed us to prepare an array of colorful compounds with simple synthetic procedure what is this dissolve this dirhodium tetraacetate and go on adding a different solvent it will give you a range of colorful compounds second we have introduced the concept of solvatochromism here we do not know many of us we do not know that the color of the complex could be because of coordination of solvent molecule and it is not because of the coordination of ligand that we have added in the reaction mixture and this solvatochromism has commercial applications okay then it has provided us an opportunity to make connections between the colors of the compounds and their uv visible spectra also it has trained us the students in acquisition of uv visible data that means you have been given an opportunity to handle a simple instrument in the laboratory which otherwise you would not do okay and it has also given you an opportunity to interpret the data by correlating the things right it has also illustrated than an extension of molecular orbital concepts right so maybe 
the molecular orbital diagram you have studied in theory were restricted to small simple diatomic molecules now that same concept you are applying to a complex molecule and how the transition would occur understanding that is very what i would say is um, uh what i can say challenging otherwise when you read through the when you read through the text you would fall asleep but when you perform a practical and try to correlate it becomes a fun and when you have fun learning while learning that fits in here permanently okay and this experiment has challenged the students to rationalize their spectrochemical series making use of pi donation and pi acid concepts okay so to summarize i would say that the presented experiment is also versatile within the inorganic curriculum and can be used to emphasize concepts such as molecular orbital diagrams metal metal bonding interactions how they happen the ligand substitutions the absorption spectroscopy inorganic synthesis and solvent mechanism right so by performing a simple and single experiment which would not take a lot of time how many concepts we are covering and that is like uh very happily we are doing it and where is the application in the gemology you see ah uh, you go to the jeweler shop and you see these uh, colorful uh gemstones and they are so expensive right and then have you ever had this question as neeraj said that is why i like i have requested <laughs> to keep my uh, talk after her because she has told you the power of good questions now the good question is why this color diamond is colorless the sapphire is blue emerald is green ruby is red and there are plenty of gemstones having use of colors okay sapphires they are uh, available in different colors rubies are not always red okay so why these colors are there and there are some gemstones they change their colors okay when you are in in the incandescent light or when you are outside in the sunlight the light the wavelength of light affects the color why now we have seen the color changes because of the transitions and the transitions there are different types of transitions so if you know the kind of impurity that is present in the lattice of these uh, gemstones then what is the coordination environment whether there is distortion in the geometry if it is perfect octahedron what would be the color usually you see and if it is tetragonally distorted transitions are affected and that would reflect in uh, color change right chromium cobalt so chromium if you have six oxygens usually it will give green color but if if with the same hexa oxo coordination uh, environment geometry is distorted you get red color and that is why ruby is red okay now for this you need to know the basic building blocks <clears throat> and i am not Uh, uh, amrit uh, how much time do i have i think it's almost yes ma'am uh, yes ma'am you may continue okay may continue. so why 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 the rubies are red what is the basic building block it is aluminum oxide isn't it so this um this what is this okay so this aluminum oxide is called as corundum okay and this is this is octahedral distorted octahedral and ruby 
is nothing but when we have a chromium 3 plus impurity in this aluminium oxide it changes its color so see when it is pure it is transparent and when one out of 100 aluminium ions is replaced by a single chromium ion we see the reflection of red color and again that can be explained with the distortion in the geometry and that is reflected in the ligand field splitting uh, uh, giving rise to that color here is another example emerald it is it is called as a beryl again an aluminum silicate which has beryllium in it okay but if this is distorted by an incoming chromium 3 plus ion as an impurity okay then the ligand field would split now this ligand field splitting is different than ruby what i said i said that it is the simple or a single metal ion the same metal ion chromium in plus 3 oxidation state here it is chromium in plus 3 oxidation state which is present as an impurity okay but what is changed changed what is changed is the coordination geometry some slight distortion has changed the homoluma gap okay and that is reflected in the color okay now um i would stop here only i think i have exceeded the time right it is 17 545 is the maximum time and i have started early so uh, yes so unless and until we 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 perform the practicals in the lab and start correlating with the theory the conceptual understanding would not happen that is what is my feeling and that is what many people <laughs> are saying now right so i wanted you to understand that performing a practical in the lab is not a time pass if you really want to learn something you start doing these things there is a lot of information one can gain from performing the simple experiment madam what is this we have performed the same experiment in bsc and in msc also we are doing the same no 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 but the practical you are doing the same but the teacher is different and the concepts that are going to be covered here are different because you need to have higher understanding about the system under investigation now okay so it is my request to all the ugpg students who are attending this workshop to take the practicals seriously this is just one practical there is plenty neeraj has said that see we can give a problem to you why can't you design the practical that is also a fun also a huge or a great learning experience then you will come to know how the people have designed and optimized the pro problem in hand okay so whatever uh, practicals that you perform in the lab we provide you the ready made procedure okay and what you do you do not take any efforts to read the procedure before hand you are so neutral you are so um un uninterested and when you are doing the titration or you are performing the practical oh this is the procedure okay what is written ha uh, a hey, take that uh, bring it here uh, add two drops a hey, color is gone huh? yes we are on the right track why the color is gone what you have added what has happened in the solution you are looking at the macroscopic property but, but you are not interpreting what is happening inside when it happens then the actual learning would happen you cannot blame the teachers you are equally at blame or to be blamed why because you are not putting an effort it it is mutual okay it is mutual so if you want to have learning you really want to learn something you want to solve the problems because henceforth after 
five to ten years, you will not find a job. Okay, which are available right now. The entire job perspective would be different. It will be all skill based, and the skill will come from where, where, unless and until you perform the experiment, the skills perspective is not developed. It will not develop. Believe me. Okay, so. if you want to excel in your future careers which is i would say will not be very straight like we had okay it will be very challenging and this is my small effort to make you aware about the challenges unless and until we try to understand we will not be able to the benefits of the questions are okay so so this was for the second part that i want on wanted to talk but due to time constraint i would stop here only and i thank you all for uh, patient hearing and if you have any questions i would be happy to answer and yes thank you madam that's all uh, forum is now open to questions participants who wish to present their questions to the madam may do so by typing them in the chat box section there is one question yes ma'am is there any report of low spin tetrahedral complex ah no i would take an a different approach okay you are a pg or ug student pg student ma'am this is where again teachers pg student okay so you must have uh you must have uh, learned uh this uh, ligand field and crystal field theory during your 12th during your ug now why don't you answer this question why because it is not like that i i am not able to answer this question or i don't want to i don't want to why because if i give you the ready made information what you would do if you have this question there is a plenty of literature go and search if i tell you i would call that as a spoon feeding is it is it possible Yes, there is an example reported. <laughs> I told you the answer, but yes. <laughs> I don't. I don't. Um. What? Have which complex right now? Which is low spin? But there is there are reports, few reports. Yes, find out. Orundhati, is it clear to you what Mam is saying? I am not giving her answer, right? That is yes. clear. <laughs> I am sorry about that. please search it and if you need you can contact ma'am exactly i am always available and i have given my email id uh, uh, on the first yes page i did not give my uh, office id because sometimes it does not work so it is always better to contact me on my gmail any other question from the participants any other question okay no 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 questions are there so thank you ma'am for delivering such a wonderful lecture i am enjoying every moment of this workshop and i think that the participants are also doing the same <coughs> i was saying in the introductory session before before you have joined that the efforts that have been put in by you neeraj madam and gulshan madam 
for this workshop is exemplary. It is a great learning experience for me as well. Thank you, madam, for all your support and cooperation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, would I would now like to invite Dr. Alokesh Hajari, sir, to address the August audience about the norms of the workshop. Sir, please. Thank you, Dr. Mitra. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes, you are audible. Good evening to all of you. First of all, I would like to give my heartfelt thanks to the most distinguished speakers, Dr. Niraja Jayaprakash Desaputre and Dr. Anu Anupakumbhar for delivering an excellent presentation. I would like uh, to express my deep gratitude to all the respected patrons. Professor Asutos Ghosh, Vice Chancellor, Rani Rasmuni Green University, Professor D. V. Prabhu, General Secretary ACT, Professor Bridges Pare, President ACT, and Professor Shantanu Chakraborty, Principal, DGDC Shingur. I also thank all the active listeners, especially beloved students. Now I would like to request all my dear participants, especially the students, to find the assignment link attached in the chat box and submit the same by tonight. Please note that in, uh, in addition to the MCQ in the assignment, there are some descriptive questions. Write in a uh, word under 150 words and submit it by tonight. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So uh, we shall meet again tomorrow. That is for all today. Thank you, Niraja, madam. Thank you, Anupa, madam. Thank you, Gulshan, Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank Please you, everyone. Take care. Yes. Yes. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Amrit, for giving this opportunity to no, <laughs> Because nowadays, what will happen? Is uh, we don't uh, see the students on campus. <laughs> yes, ma'am. And uh, I'm sorry about exceeding the limit, but yes. No, ma'am, no problem. No problem. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Please, please take care of your health. Yes, you too. Thank, Thank you. you.